Okay, hello. Um, don't know what topic is for. <laughs> Anyway, philosophy 112, American philosophy. Right here, Kelly. Let him practice here. <laughs> you, um, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, and you can call me Abe or Professor Stone. I'm perfect, perfectly fine the other way. Um, uh, today, since it's, uh, there's no reading yet, I'm just first going to go through the syllabus and then I'm gonna you know, discuss administrative matters and then I'm gonna give a short introduction to the course. We might not go the whole time. Um, and I printed out hard copies of the syllabus but the printer in the Cowell Annex kind of died in the middle. So I don't think there, there may not be enough, but <laughs> I'm gonna pass them out. I mean, you don't need the hard copy to see the syllabus online. I, uh, no, I guess I'll look at more of my computer. Um, okay, so, and this is the first time I've ever taught this course, so it's exciting, <laughs> but also I'm a little nervous. <laughs> um, all right, so, um, uh, yeah, I'll just go through what it says on the syllabus first. Um, I guess first I should write this. People that UCSC EDU go back workers. And if you go there, there's a list of like every course I've ever taught, but the ones I'm teaching now are at the top. And there's a link to the syllabus and there will be links to the assignments, which I haven't written yet <laughs> because I've never taught this course before. Um, um, so like whatever you see here will be there. And if there's any change later, it'll be updated on the online syllabus. Um, that URL is on the syllabus also. Okay. Um, so I'll skip the course description because that's what I'm going to talk about. Oh, so there were more than me. All right. Um, I'll skip this, the course description because that's what I'm going to talk about when I give an introduction to the course. Um, but so I will talk about this next thing here. It says modality, right? So I'm going to lecture in person here with some exceptions I'm about to mention. <laughs> But I'm going to lecture in person here, but I'm going to stream all the lectures over Zoom and also record them. Um, I definitely, I mean, it's weird and depressing when no one comes to class and you're kind of lecturing to no one. So I do hope people will come, but you know, uh, uh, you're not required to. Um, um, and then the next thing it says is, that because of the Jewish holiday schedule this quarter, uh, the next, the first two weeks are going to be kind of chaos. Um, so uh, um, there will be no lecture on Thursday, and then there'll be lectures on Monday and Tuesday at weird times but via Zoom only. Um, and there'll be one more Monday lecture after that via Zoom, and then after that will be on the the regular schedule until there's one other weird thing at the end of May. Um, so like if you can't make those unusual times, you can watch the recording on YouTube. Um, but again, I hope some people will come virtually to those. Um, course requirements. So like I said, I haven't actually written these 
assignments yet. <laughs> so, um, uh, but there will be um, two short essays, which will be just like essay questions and then a slightly longer final paper. And the grade will be mostly based on a final paper. Um, that, but like I said, the first two assignments will be like uh, essay questions and the final paper will be more open-ended paper assignment. Um, and let's see, is there anything else I have to say here? Papers will be due on Canvas. I, I haven't created those assignments on Canvas yet either, but I will. Or if I don't and the paper's coming due, remind me. <laughs> um, uh, Please don't plagiarize. I used to just say, uh, like, oh, don't plagiarize. But uh, recently, there seems to have been more of it. So I'm saying, please don't plagiarize. And I guess, uh, um, uh, Put it this way, like I've never failed someone on an assignment they handed in, except when they when I caught the plagiarism. <laughs> so, like, if you think you can't write a very good paper, uh, you know, uh, maybe it's not great, but it's going to pass. Um, so, I mean, obviously, I can't guarantee that if you hand in like pages of gibberish or something like that. But, you know, so like, please don't do this. It's so annoying. I don't know if chat. GPT is going to become an issue now as well. Uh, <laughs> I guess there's a detector for it or something. I hope I don't have to get involved in that. Um, but yeah, please don't do that either. <laughs> um, I mean, obviously, like, I guess, well, I don't know. What is obvious here? You could use it to help you write. Why not? Then where's the borderline? I don't know. <laughs> anyway. Sorry, this is a philosopher trying to <laughs> give you instructions. Um, yeah, uh, um, just make sure that what you hand it is your own work. Um, and there's my FAQ. Uh, I haven't changed that for a long time, but I think it's still all accurate. Um, and finally, it says, so attendance at lecture is not a course requirement. Uh, I strongly urge you to come to lecture. That's like the whole point of the course, basically. It's, I mean, but uh, but I'm not going to take attendance. Um, so, uh, I mean, you're paying me, right? Like, I'm not paying you. <laughs> All right. Uh, and then the text. I so like. I've ordered most of the readings are, are available on campus. Um, there's just four books that I ordered basically. Well, so Thoreau's Walden I ordered because it's so cheap and like you should have that. <laughs> um, the other three I ordered because we're reading a large part of the book or the, the whole book. Uh, and uh, they're not old enough to be public domain. So um, uh, I guess let me know if you have trouble getting those or whatever. They're also on reserve at McHenry. Um, I think that is all the administrative issues I need to discuss. Are there any questions about that before I start talking about the content? Course. Okay. Um, so, um, oh, and I guess I, sh I should have said if, like, if you need to reach me, the best way is to send me email. There's also this thing, I'm not even sure if it still works. I think it still works. Notify Abe. I set it up for Google um, Apps, and um, basically it allows you to send a push notification to my phone. I have to like I did this at a time when I was kind of like not getting to my email very well, so people were having a really hard time getting in touch with me. 
Um, I, I think I'm kind of I've overcome that problem now, but uh, but I will put the you know names of the people who are in the course now in the list there, and then you should be able to use it if you need to reach me and I'm not responding to my email. You can send me a short message. I can't reply to that message, but you can send me a message saying like, read my email or whatever. Um, okay. Um, so um, what, what might be meant by American philosophy? Um, I mean, so obviously, first of all, there's a big issue about what might be meant by philosophy, period. Right? When I taught intro, I mean, maybe this is why, why they haven't had me teach intro for a while now. <laughs> but when I used to teach intro, I would start by saying, uh, you might think an introduction to philosophy would start, would start with a brief explanation of what philosophy is. Okay? But I said, actually, that's the hardest problem in all philosophy. <laughs> So I can't start with it. Right. So um, but leaving that aside for the moment, anyway, what might you mean by American philosophy? Um, so I mean, there by now have been lots and lots of philosophers who lived and worked in America. I guess, by the way, I should say, um, um, I take it. If, well, both based on the course description, the official course description, which I'm not really following, but still, um, based on the course description and also otherwise it would be impossible, I take it America in the title here means the United States of America. Right? So, I mean, um, because uh, Otherwise, why would it be impossible? Well, it's two huge continents, right? Like imagine teaching a course called European philosophy. <laughs> um, right. So, um, um, but even so, even if you limit American philosophy to mean, you know, uh, the United States of America, um, there have been uh, a lot of um, philosophers who have lived and worked here, thousands and thousands. Um, and that would be like uh, true even if we limit this. So going back to this question for a second, um, by philosophy, do we mean like Western philosophy, like the tradition of philosophy that starts with Plato and Aristotle, approximately I mean, a little bit before that, maybe or whatever. Uh, if we don't mean that, then uh, of course there's like hundreds of cultures which have existed in this area and still, um, um, many of them still exist anyway, <laughs> despite our best efforts. Otherwise, so. Uh, um uh well do they, does every culture have something that could be called philosophy is philosophy like in other words is the word philosophy like art or religion or is the word philosophy like ballet right where like not every culture has ballet so i mean uh Well, again, that's a really hard question. Uh, I mean, it's like, it certainly seems like when you look at what people did in India and China and whatever, like even though it's completely independent of Western philosophy, it looks like they're doing the same thing. So, but, you know, does that mean that the, what the Kiowa and the Iroquois and whatever we're doing necessarily is the same thing? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, that, uh, um, to try to expand it to that would again make the course impossible, right? Like, I mean, there's no way I could, I mean, uh, I don't know those languages and uh, there's hundreds of them, and right? So, um, uh, um, so, so like that's another narrowing of the definition here of what the course is about. And we will be reading some stuff by Native American philosophers, uh, writers, uh, 
basically only one who really considers herself a philosopher who takes that out in one brief section towards the beginning. But those people are, um, well, especially Viola Cordova, we're going to need read near the end. I mean, she's definitely, uh, I don't know what the right way to put it is. Uh, she's trying to engage with that tradition of Western philosophy, although she's definitely still also trying to express something about Native American thought. So, I mean, we'll see when we get to that, how she works that out. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's one reading in the whole quarter. Uh, shouldn't it be more? Yeah, it should be more. I mean, my, like my frustration putting the syllabus together was, I actually, when I first agreed to teach this course, my first reaction was like, oh no, what am I gonna do? <laughs> and I started like desperately looking for stuff. And then my second reaction was, oh my God, how am I gonna fit everything in? <laughs> so, um, so, but anyway, uh, uh, that, that was all a long interruption of myself. <laughs> if you haven't had me before as a professor, you'll get used to that being the way I talk, unfortunately. So it was all a long interruption of when I said, by now there have been hundreds or thousands of philosophers, well, thousands, definitely, of philosophers who lived and worked in America. So even with these narrowings that I just mentioned, it still couldn't be a course about all philosophy written in America, right? And um Moreover, um, you know, since World War II, at least the post-war era, America has become one of the main centers of philosophy in the world. So, um, so it would also be weird to make this course about like philosophy done in America because Every kind of philosophy is done in America. Um, so, uh, um, what's gonna? Do I do this now. So I don't usually talk about myself when I when I start a philosophy course, <laughs> um, other than to say what my email is and stuff like that. Um, but I am an American philosopher. <laughs> um, so, and moreover, I mean, another thing we'll see when we get to uh, the Cordova is that um, she starts with stories about where she comes from. And she says that like her Euro-American, as she puts it, although of course that's right, not everyone who's not Native American is from Euro. <laughs> but anyway, her Euro-American interlocutors don't understand why she's doing that when she's writing about philosophy. They're like, why are you telling us about your family and whatever? Um, uh, but it seems like it might be relevant. And I think you'll see a little bit, maybe see a little bit more why it might be relevant when I get to what I did decide to make the course about. So I'm just going to say, I am actually going to say something about myself. I think, um, I mean, I feel like in this course in particular, you need to know who's talking about this stuff. So, you know, I was born, I was born in Washington, DC. In 1966, <laughs> my father was a expert in tax law, and he was working in the Treasury in the Johnson administration. And then we moved to Berkeley when I was six months old. And we lived in Berkeley until I was about ten, and then we moved to LA. And then I went to college in the on the East Coast. Which, if someone tells you they went to college and they're really vague about where it was, that probably means they went to Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so like the same place that, for example, uh, Henry David Thoreau went, right? 
So, um, um, obviously, uh, just based on what I said on the syllabus and based on my funny hat, right? I'm Jewish. <laughs> Um, but it's it's a little bit complicated. So my mother converted to Judaism. So my father's side, um, my father's parents arrived in the U.S. around 1910 separately. I mean, but they came from the same place and they, they arrived separately and then they met and married uh, in Malden, Massachusetts. But they came from a place called, uh, or the vicinity of a village called Mihova, which is now, it's now in Ukraine. It's now in southwestern Ukraine. Um, in those days, it was first, it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and then it was part of Romania. Um, um, the extended family that stayed there, like, mostly got killed later on. Right. I mean, they were actually, it wasn't the Germans who killed them, as I understand it. I mean, actually, not as I understand it. I talked to someone who survived it. <laughs> um, it wasn't the Germans who killed them. The, their, their neighbors killed them before the Germans got them. <laughs> right. So, you know, and so, like, that's that side of my family. And maybe I should also say that my father, when he graduated from Harvard Law School, and he applied for jobs with big firms in New York. They said, uh, sorry, we don't hire Jews. <laughs> like they didn't know there was no like beating around the bush or whatever. <laughs> like, oh, sorry, we don't hire Jews at this firm. So, you know, there's that side of the family. On my mother's side, I'm a Mayflower descendant. <laughs> I'm descended from Richard Warren. Richard Warren has apparently about 14 million descendants. Uh, uh, Taylor Swift also is a Richard, Moore, Richard Warren descendant, so I hear. Right, so, you know, um, wait, did this video come back on? Because he had a lot of children and they all lived to adulthood, which was unusual among Mayflower passengers, right? So yeah, so he had 14 million descendants. Um, I guess therefore this is considered like as as I hear, like not the best kind of Mayflower descent, right? Like the other ones are like, oh, they're just a bit <laughs> But anyway, you know, so. There it is. I'm a Euro American for sure. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, that's that's my maternal grandfather's side. My maternal grandmother's side, um, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, which is going to get a uh, shout out, I believe, by Du Bois in our reading. Famous for having uh, been Emily Dickinson's editor, famous and controversial. Uh, he's also famous because he was um, became the commanding officer of the first Black regiment during the Civil War, and he wrote a book about that. Um, He's not actually my ancestor. He's my like first cousin seven times removed, <laughs> right? So in other words, it was an all black regiment, but they put this white guy, you know, in charge. So that's who he was. Um, I think Du Bois is going to mention him because after the war, he was involved in collecting Negro spirituals. Um, okay. What, you know, why did I go through all that? I'm not sure, again, I just feel like it might be important <laughs> in a course that's about this. Okay, so, uh, are there any questions about my, <laughs> any questions about my family in Ukraine or whatever? No, so, um, 
All right, so so that's who I am, and I'm facing this question, like, what is this course supposed to be about? So I think, like, typically what a course like this would be about, um, and I think, so it hasn't been taught very much here in recent years. I think when it used to be taught regularly here, and you can see from the official course description that this is the way it was taught, that... Um, so for, so it's not about all philosophy of any kind that's ever been done in America, but it would be about distinctively American schools of philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, so there have been basically three, right? So, okay, so as I said, since now, since World War II, America is not the center of philosophy in the world, but one of them, definitely, right? So uh, there can't really be distinctively American schools of philosophy now, right? Like whatever happens here is internationally significant. But earlier there were, I think, three main um, distinctively American schools of philosophy. And even though this is not what the course is based on, I'm gonna talk about what they were. Um, so, because, I mean, for one thing, we will be reading people at least connected to all three of them. Um, right, so the first one was New English Transcendentalism. Um, there were two branches of New England Transcendentalism, actually. The more famous one is the Boston or Concord branch, and the less famous one is the Vermont branch. So, I mean, the Boston branch, um, we're going to be reading stuff by three people from the Boston branch. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Mary David Thoreau, And just a tiny bit of Margaret Fuller. Now, actually, when I teach 107, which is uh, 19th century philosophy, I spend a lot, actually, quite a while on Margaret Fuller. And that's actually why I didn't want to spend a lot of time on her in this course, because I want to do other stuff that I don't do in the other course. Um, Emerson also, there's only, we're only reading this one essay by Emerson because I, we read a lot more by Emerson in my 19th century course. Um, but so these people were all active um, around the beginning to middle of the 19th century, right? His dates are 18 of this is terrible. I also couldn't print out my notes because the printer died. So I'm like going back and forth to it. Oh, he's younger. Yeah. And Margaret Pillar, she died pretty young. She died in a ship wreck. Um, so, I mean, I'm not going to try to summarize what the content of the school of philosophy is. When we get to these people, I'm going to talk about what they say, obviously. Um, but I'm just giving a, you know, like, I guess I should, I mean, there's one thing I can say about it. Before the rise of New England transcendentalism, American philosophy was heavily influenced by British empiricism and Scottish common sense philosophy. Um, so, uh, and Jonathan Edwards, who is the first person we're going to be reading, is uh, an example of that, even though he, he doesn't really necessarily agree with Locke. Um, he's heavily like, influenced by Locke. Um, so these people were kind of a reaction to that. Um, they were uh, 
Um, in some ways, I'm interested in German philosophers, Kant and Hegel and Schelling, also Coleridge, um, um, who's playing a famous English poet, but also a philosopher, a Kantian philosopher. Um, but they were also influenced by a lot of other stuff. Um, and the Vermont branch, um, um, we're unfortunately not going to manage to get anything by James Marsh onto the syllabus, but, um, A little bit older than these people um, was, and it's a similar story. Maybe I think more explicitly, actually, right? So, like James Marsh starts off by talking about contemporary British and Scottish empiricist philosophy, and then says, "But you know, that's all bad, and Coleridge is good." <laughs> um, the only reason I really mention this here at all is that John Dewey, who I'm going to get to in a moment. Uh, studied at the University of Vermont. Now, he didn't study under James Marsh. It was after James Marsh had already died, but um, uh, he was uh, um, James Marsh's ideology was still, you know, like going at the University of Vermont at the time. So uh, there, was a, there was like a connection there to later on American philosophy. All right, so that's one school, and as I said, we're going to be reading just one essay by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Um, uh, a few things, not enough by Henry David Thoreau, and one short piece by Margaret Fuller. So the second, I should have asked if it was okay to write that right now. <laughs> The second one and this is the least famous one of the one you maybe um, won't have heard of before. but like if I was set, if I was organizing the course this way, I would definitely try to get some St. Louis Hegelians here. Um, um, the main person here was William um, so, like, if you look at the dates of the people on the syllabus, you'll see that there's um, there's like a cluster in the early 19th century, and then there's kind of like a break, and then there's a cluster in the early 20th century. So, like, these people came in between those two parts of the syllabus. Um, I didn't um, um, I didn't find a way to fit those people into the course. It would have been a nice thing to do, I think, especially so um, the, so it's weird. These people it started in St. Louis, obviously, hence the name, but they were involved in like educational reform in St. Louis. So William Torrey Paris actually started the first kindergarten school in America. That was part of his Hegelianism, was to start kindergartens. Um, and I guess partly because it, they were involved in education and educating teachers, um, it, for uh, the first time in American history, um, a lot of members of the school were women. Um, including uh, Marietta Keese, who was one of the first American women to get a PhD in philosophy. 
see normally I have like my notes printed out. And I include the little oh, all right. Anyway. Really can I mean I don't know why I'm writing all these dates. No, I do know why, but it's still so like I don't like I don't remember dates, you know, like I just look it up in Wikipedia and copy it into my notes. Like, <laughs> um, but like the dates are important, right? Because you now you get a feel of what time period this school was. As I said, it's a time period we're not really covering. So, um, however, there is one person that we're going to read who was associated with this school. Um, uh, I mean, he was younger than this. Write this and write his dates down here. Well, this is what I should have done all along. The books are on the sofa. 1855 to 1969. Yes. Not that much younger than Mary Desire Royce was associated with the school. So this is the quote we're going to get to reading St. Louis Neo Hegelians. Desire Royce was uh, um, born in Grass Valley, California. In 1855, his parents came in the gold rush, and he was one of the first. He was in one of the first graduating course classes of the University of California. Um, so he was kind of like the first uh, Californian philosophy. <laughs> so I knew that I had to get him on the syllabus because it's you know like how could I how could I teach American philosophy at the University of California and not reach his eyes? He didn't stay in California, though. He actually spent most of his professional life at Harvard. Um, OK, so I mean, uh, these people, they're called Hegelians because they were like much more explicitly trying to import Hegel's philosophy to America. Um, and um, use it to explain how education should work and how um, politics should work. Um, they didn't leave, right? Like people mostly haven't heard of them these, these days. Um, they didn't leave a big imprint on the American mind, but they did by way of other people who are influenced by them. Um, um, back to what happened later. And they were, it was definitely a distinctively American school. Okay, so like those two schools I just mentioned are kind of the, um, I, I don't know, it's, it's a, like the third one is the one that you would usually think this course would be about. <laughs> right? It's called pragmatism. Right? So oftentimes, if you say American philosophy, you mean you're going to teach pragmatism. Pragmatism was a school of philosophy. Um, the main figure was William James. Um, 1842 to 1910. Um, so uh, there isn't any William James on the syllabus. <laughs> William James is probably um, like the most famously American philosopher. <laughs> right? Like you get like if you say American philosophy, people will say, oh, William James. <laughs> um, 
and he was very influential on European philosophers afterwards, and like he was he was a big deal. Um, I looked for something by him I could use in this course, and I just I couldn't find him. Um, but I did find the kind of second generation of pragmatism, John Dewey. With my ripe old age. Um, um, this was maybe the wrong way to start, but anyway, I'm, I'm committed, so I'm going to keep going. Right. So um, it's the wrong way to start because I want to say, like, that I did find what I was looking for in John Dewey, but what was I looking for? I didn't say that yet. <laughs> Right, so I'm just giving you a whole bunch of names and dates and then said, but I'm not doing that. Maybe this was all a mistake. <laughs> but um, um, but I did find what I was looking for in John Dewey. So what was I looking for? Um, I, I just I I I didn't want to make this course about pragmatism or make this course about pragmatism and throw in a couple of uh, people from New England transcendentalists or St. Louis Hegelians. Um, not that that would necessarily be a bad course. I mean, I do, I do teach other courses that are like that. Um, but uh, um, and by the way, I should say also that W. E.B. Du Bois, who we're going to be reading a bunch of stuff by, um, is sometimes associated with this school. I'm not sure I see why, to tell you the truth. But um, so uh, I didn't want to do it about that because it seems to me that there's something much more interesting you could mean by American philosophy, and that's what I wanted to do the course about. So what did I want to make the course about? Well, um, something about the relationship between America and philosophy. Right, not just philosophers who happen to have lived in America. And not just philosophers who had something distinctively American about them, but uh, what is the philosophical issue about America? Yeah, that you know, um, there's there's kind of two levels or two parts to that, as I understand it. So the first one is just like America as a philosophical issue. And, you know, so like thinking of it this way doesn't, you know, doesn't put philosophy in question. It's like, so here's philosophy, and we have a profession of philosophy, and we know how to deal with certain types of issues or problems and how to solve them. And the question is, like, what kind of issue or problem is posed by America of the kind that philosophers are interested in? Um, yeah, of course, remember, I said to begin with that I don't know how to define what philosophers are. <laughs> So, um, so when I say what philosophers are interested in, I don't know how to derive that from first principles. But, um, and, you know, on a deeper level, I think that's going to be a further issue of that relationship here. But for now, just assume we know, like, what a philosophical problem is like. What kind of philosophical problem is posed by America? Well, so 
Um, as I understand it, the basic issue, the reason why America and are other countries not like this? I think like every country where people begin to do philosophy, they do start to ask the question, right? Some kind of philosophical question about Germanness, about Frenchness, or whatever. Um, but it's not gonna be the same kind of question that, that I'm coming up with. Uh, so the question I think um, that's Um, the question that's raised by America has something to do with a problem about the universal, particular, and individual. Um, what do I mean by that? By the way, I guess. Um, My notes are moving. Sorry, hold on a second. I can put this up, please. There we go. Um, um, so basically, like, think about universal moral principles. Um, and assume for a moment that the universal moral principle in every situation tells you what is the right thing to do and what is the well, what is the right thing to do. So um, there's that kind of universal principle seems to be in tension with any kind of particular law or principle. Right? Because like if I say, well, um, you know, in addition to this universal law, there's also, I'm also under particular obligations. Uh, I have, right, like some particular allegiance, something like that. Then it seems like, well, what's the result of that going to be? So either it's going to tell you to do what the universal law already told you, in which case it's superfluous. Or it's going to tell you to do something else, in which case you shouldn't do it because it's against the universal law. So, for that reason, appeal to universal principles seems to go along with number one, individualism. So, I mean, this word individualism is one we're going to keep seeing in this course. Um, uh, some people like it, but a lot of people don't like it, <laughs> whatever it is, but it's not clear what it is exactly. But, I mean, uh, if you think it, of individualism as meaning something like um, each individual uh, is like, has to consider themselves separately from whatever, whatever their particular background is, right? So, like, or like, so if I come in to teach a philosophy course um, as an individual, I should just talk, start talking about what's true and what's false, what's right and what's wrong. You shouldn't have to know who my ancestors. How could that be relevant? Um, um, that's, uh, that, what I'm saying is that the, the appeal to universal principles, universal principles of right and wrong and true and false seems to lead to that kind of individualistic conclusion. 
And uh, it also seems to lead to anarchism. Right? Like, uh, um, the law of a particular country is this kind of particular law. So, like, what authority could it have? Right? Like, who's allowed to legislate new obligations that aren't already contained in the universal law? So, like, if the universal law really always tells you what to do, the answer is no one, right? No one's authorized to do it. And, like, if you want an example of universal law, uh, I mean, we're about to see one in Jonathan Edwards, and it's basically utilitarian. Um, I mean, uh, if these um, maximizing the good for, for all, something like that, right? So, uh, like, I mean, if you if you plug in that that particular universal law, <laughs> if you plug in that universal law, you get something like, uh, you know, at whatever time I have to decide what to do, I should decide based on what's going to be best for everyone. All finite rational beings, probably, and you know, like in principle. So, uh, um, so either what the government is telling me to do is in line with that. In that case, I should do it, but not because the government's telling me to do it, right? But because it's best, <laughs> best for all. Or it's not what the government's telling me to do is not in line with that, in which case I should. Um, so, I mean, of course, there are ways to try to deal with this. Um, um, this was uh, what I taught a grad seminar about in the fall, the history of philosophers trying to explain how there can be such a thing as promises. Right, like a promise means that I I had no obligation to do something, and then I said I had an obligation, and now I have one. How did that, how did that happen? <laughs> right. So I mean, promises, and another thing you can appeal to here, here is gratitude, the duty of gratitude. Right. Those those are so like. The, the way you try to do that is to say, well, it's a universal principle that you should keep your promises and that you should show gratitude for benefits received, right? So that's a universal principle, but then it means that you end up with particular obligations, right? So you can try to found the idea of government on social contract, which is a kind of promise. So, like, why should you do what the government tells you to do? Well, because you promised to. Sort of. <laughs> I mean, when did I promise that, right? But <laughs> that's that's the idea. Or you could try to promise to count it on gratitude. That's something that Socrates already does um, in the uh, in the Crito, I guess, is where that is, right? Where he says. Uh, where they, his friends wanted to get him out of prison so like he won't um, be executed. <laughs> and he says, well, but look, the, this is what the laws of Athens will say to me. We brought you up. You lived here your whole life. You owe everything to us. How can you turn against us now? <laughs> right? So um, um, you could try to... to down this kind of particular obligation on promises or gratitude, but it's not easy, right? I mean, go back to that utilitarian argument I was making before. Um, it seems like, and if you don't like utilitarianism, you can use some other universal moral principle, right? But it seems like the, um, the idea of a promise is basically that, like, I had some realm of indifference where it was just up to me what to do. 
And now by promising, I narrow that down. Right? So like before I promise, you know, like let's say I promise to meet you um, at Starbucks tomorrow. So before I promised, I could have gone to Starbucks tomorrow or I could have gone somewhere else. Now, like I've narrowed it down, I have to go to Starbucks. But if this thing really tells you exactly what you need to do at every instance, you don't have any realm of discretion like that to narrow down. You're like, there's like a previous promise, so to speak, right? You're already obliged. So like either going to Starbucks was the best thing for all rational creatures in general, like would increase their, maximize their happiness or it wasn't. <laughs> and if it was, you were required to go there already. And if it wasn't, you were required to go somewhere else already. And there's no like discretion for promises. And you can make similar arguments about gratitude based I mean, that like, uh, like, um, if you can make, if you can maximize happiness for all rational creatures by giving something to the person who didn't benefit you, then it's like corrupt to give it to the other person just because they benefit you. Right? It's like, um, um, yeah, it's like political corruption. Right. So, I mean, so this is really actually a difficult problem. I mean, not saying that like philosophers, I mean, including if you take 144 and talk about Hobbes and Locke and et cetera, like, I mean, uh, they do have something to say about how to solve this, but it's a difficult problem. And um, in view of this, it seems really weird that America is a particular country that somehow claims to be based on universal principles. It seems like that's impossible. It seems like, um, and we'll see some of our authors saying just this, it seems like it must be delusional. Right, like you think you're you're appealing to universal principles, but um, you're obviously not because what it comes out to is something for some particular group of people, people who think of themselves as Americans, and they narrow that down. Right, they leave out South America and they leave out Canada and they leave out Indigenous people and they pray right, and they. Uh, leave out slaves, obviously. I mean, to say that word right away at the beginning of this course, they leave that out. Um, uh, and they say, um, you know, all men are created equal as long as they're Americans. <laughs> right? So, um, so, like, uh, um, there, right there, you can see that, that America and whatever is good and bad and problematic about America is like is all somehow involved in like it, like some deep philosophical question. Um, um, So that's kind of like when I when I chose readings for the course, I was I was looking for people who engage with that sometimes. Who and, and engage with that as Americans. Um, well, of course, so Jonathan Edwards uh, died in the 1750s, so he was not right, he was not American in the sense of a citizen of the United States of America. And we're going to be reading one book by um, George Grant, who is Canadian, <laughs> so he didn't think of himself as American in this sense. But um, um, uh, Jonathan Edwards, well, I'll talk about, you know, like, I mean, I think 
you can see before the revolution, people were already thinking about this question. Um, and as for George Grant, his discussion of Canada is the, the very possibility of Canada is based on this kind of worry about America. Um, America claims to be universal. How can there be, this is the philosophical question about Canada. How can there be a border between the universal republic and something else that looks just like it? Right? I mean, they even have the same grocery stores and whatever, right? And something else that looks just like it, but it's not because of this border. That's uh, anyway, I'll talk about that when we get to it. Um, so, so as I said, that's one way of looking at what the issue is. Um, I think there's a deeper issue here, um, which, so as I said, to start out with, this is like America looked at as a problem from the point of view of philosophy. Philosophy is like interested in America. Um, but I think America also is a kind of image and like possible rival for philosophy. Because this problem that I'm talking about that occurs in the case of America occurs in the case of philosophy also. Philosophy is always some particular tradition. Whether it's that Western tradition I was talking about um, or some other tradition. There's always a particular institution, there's particular texts, or, you know, um, there's particular questions that people ask because it's traditional to ask those questions. Yeah. Um, why? Why is that the case? I mean, I. We may have different understandings of philosophy, but for me, it, it seems that that's not necessarily a requirement for it to be philosophy. There are institutions of philosophy. There, there are disciplines involved with philosophy, but I don't think it's accurate to say that you need those things in order to do that. Well, it's a good question. It is a good question. I mean, I think as a matter of fact, it's always the case. There's an institution of philosophy. Um, it's not always the same institution. Um, but philosophers form schools. Um, uh, now, I mean, I guess you could say something like isn't philosophy the name? So it wouldn't be like art or religion. Or like ballet, it would be more like imagination, <laughs> right? Like philosophy is just a kind of attitude or something like that. Um, I don't want to say, what do I want to say about this? It would be tempting to say something, right? It would be tempting to say something like, yeah, there's a kind of, I mean, so like here's something similar you could say about you could say about science, right? That like every time someone tries to figure out why something happened, they're doing science. Right? So um, like uh, if I hear a crash in the next room. And I go and look to see whether the cat did it, or you know, or something else. Then I'm that I'm a scientist, right? Like that's science. So you know, I mean, I think like without saying that that's necessarily that false. I didn't. I mean, you could, yeah, you could say that, but I mean, but of course, like. Um, the interesting, important thing we call science is a lot more than that. And it is a big institution, among other things. 
this, right? So, like, so, so in other words, I think what I'm heading towards here, but this is what I don't want to say, but it's really tempting, right? Is to say something like, well, that's kind of amateur philosophy, right? You know, but of course, when you do it seriously, you need an institution. You need. So you want the institution. What? So you want the institution. Like the the issues and the problems and the techniques are important, and so you build an institution. They are important because you have the institution. Um. Yeah, I think that may be a more appropriate to science than it is to philosophy. To tell you the truth. Uh, building institution because I mean I spent a lot of time studying different philosophical schools <laughs> and I don't think that's a good explanation of why they start. Uh, okay, two more. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> instead, are you, instead of like in the interpretation of like an institution or something like that, are you more so like equating how America, or at least the founding of America and the founding, they said, you know, as you said, all men could equal all these statements were these these claims, these universe, like these ideas, these thought processes were uh, exclaimed and said and written as like, this is how it, it should be or this is how it's going to be. But then the actual application of that didn't pan out. And then in the same way, are you equating that to like, certain philosophers or certain philosophical schools that they proclaim certain things, but then like even their application of things might not have panned out in the way that it should have, quote unquote, or is that what it is? Or Well, I mean, so I do think that, um, I mean, so first of all, what I was saying before was not like, they may, you know, uh, of course we understand what it would be to found a, a nation on universal principles, and then unfortunately it didn't pan out. I was saying, actually, it's really hard to understand what it would mean to found a nation on universal principles, right? That like a nation seems to need particularity. Um, and I mean, I'm going to talk about the Declaration of Independence as one of our texts soon, but so like not to give too much away, but really the Declaration of Independence starts, it doesn't start, we hold these truths to be self-evident. It starts when in the course of human events becomes necessary for one, not quite quoting it word by word, but it becomes necessary for one people to declare its independence from another. That's not what it says. But anyway, something like that, right? So, but, uh, um, it's aiming for separateness, division, right? We're not British anymore. <laughs> and yet, when they, then when they say they have to, when, well, when Jefferson says he has to justify that, he says, gives this list of universal principles yeah so then like so then you're referring to how the, like the creation of america was like a separation from something else and then even uh even after for example like american principles or values aren't applied to people who aren't american yeah i mean right that's i mean it's different sides of the same problem because like i was like i was trying to so I was trying to say like this fundamental problem about how like how you can found particularity on universal claims is you know like um, I guess put it this way I was trying to say it's not just an interesting puzzle about America it's tied to the real life problems of America <laughs> right so it's uh, I mean um, but it is also a, um like a deep philosophical puzzle yeah um when we're talking about the institutions would it be helpful or more apt to say it is more of the framework in which the the philosophy or institution itself is based off of because america is based off of these universal principles 
that can be applied to pretty much any people and utilized in any, pretty much any school of philosophy. But the problem comes when these American philosophers and what America is based off of uses these universal principles in particular to themselves to separate them to separate from another people who by definition these universal principles would also apply yeah i mean that's both yes that, that's both the logical puzzle right like how could you even claim to do that we're separating ourselves into a separate nation based on these universal principles that apply to everyone and as I said, like the case of Canada is, is in some ways that, you know, I, I think people don't usually think of Canada as philosophically interesting, but it is, it's super interesting, right? It's uh, like, of course the same principles would apply on the other side of the border. Why wouldn't it? Nothing changes when it's less, <laughs> right? So like, um, um, so I'm saying, yeah, I'm saying that's both the logical puzzle of how can you even claim to do that, and also the moral, practical, uh, not puzzle, but like real life problem. But what are you actually going to do now? Is it going to be a good thing? <laughs> right. So um, oh, there's a couple more questions. That's great. I just I wanted I, before I just wanted to say one more thing about institutions, like the institution of philosophy. I mean, maybe it's like when, this is an example that that maybe this will help explain. I, I don't think it answers your question about like isn't philosophy doesn't philosophy not need an institution or something like that. But this is an example. So this was a medieval science. People would attribute it to Aristotle. Anicus Plato said, Magis Anicus Veritas. Right? Plato is a friend, or Plato is dear, but a greater friend is truth. Right? Or truth is even more dear. Um, it's based on something Aristotle actually says in the Nicomachean Ethics. But it's it's like pithier, I guess, than what Aristotle actually says there. So, right, this says that you know there can be no authority in philosophy, no matter how dear and important a figure is, like Plato. The truth is more dear. We choose the truth instead. But people quote this on the authority of Aristotle. <laughs> Right, they'll say like, as the philosopher says, the philosopher is Aristotle, right? As the philosopher says, Anicus Plato and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> right, this is like the contradiction of how philosophy is in a particular institution. It started, this, this school it started in a particular place at a particular time with a particular person who had a particular teacher, Plato, right? Um, and like, if you're a member of that school, you're going to quote. I mean, it's additionally interesting because he didn't say exactly this, right? But you're going to, and, and he didn't say anything in Latin, obviously. Right? But um, uh, what he said was in Greek, you know, but like, you're going to quote this person. But what you quote the person to say is, that it shouldn't matter who said it. Right, so like that's that's why I'm saying that the philosophy has this a burden of the same problem that America has. That, it, you know, so like, I, get, I mean, yes, you can ask. I mean, I think this is equivalent to like, some people are gonna read are gonna say, yes, anarchism. Right? And they're going to say that the, the 
correct conclusion from traditional American principles is anarchism. No America, no other country. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think that's similar to saying, yeah, this saying is right for philosophers. The only, the only mistake was to quote it on Aristotle's authority. Right? They should have just done, said, we can do without it. So maybe people can live without government, and maybe philosophers can philosophize without institutions. I'm kind of skeptical about both. <laughs> but maybe. <laughs> right? So, um, but uh, uh, if not, if, or I mean, I guess at least, um, if you're not doing that or not trying to do that, Right? If you're saying, I'm an American, and I said that, right? I said, I'm an American philosopher. <laughs> you're saying, I'm an American. Or if you're saying, like, I'm a doctor of philosophy, <laughs> like, what, what made me a doctor of philosophy? Well, like, a long time ago in Paris and Oxford, they were, you know, like, they started making doctors of philosophy. And if you trace it down, you get to make <laughs> <laughs> Um, most of the people as doctors of philosophy now don't teach philosophy, they teach something else, but still, well, that's how it started, right? Um, um, so if you're if you if you say that about yourself, then you can you're confronting this problem. Or you should be. How can I work within this institution that you're at? Okay, sorry, I know you've had your hand up for a long time. So I, I know, so I guess I'm trying to figure out what the, the driving focus of this this class was. This wasn't specifically or seems to be the question of like what is it what is it that we mean when we say that we're doing an American philosophy course? Right? And so we've got like two terms, America and philosophy that are coming into relation with each other. And so we try to figure out uh, you know, in relation to these two terms, which two of these, uh, which definition of both of them makes the best. Uh, words or something like that. So we've got America, and so we have the question of like, well, what is it that we say when we mean America? And so you focused on, you know, but well, we don't really mean like America is a two continents, because that's just too massive, it's too general, too big. Uh, do we mean America in relation to philosophy is like, uh, you know, to say history? I guess now we have into philosophy, that philosophy is like, is philosophy a tradition? Is it a a historical tradition, or is it this thing that's universal across cultures? Like, is it religion, or is it ballet, <laughs> um, or is it you know a faculty of the mind, or something like imagination? And America is, you know, we could do America and philosophy as, say, historically the American schools of philosophy, right? As yeah. this historical procedure, of, you know, we're just looking historically at what was American geographically and what philosophy was done there. Or we could say as a question, instead we move to America as a philosophical issue instead as the relation between the two. And so what America provides as the United States of America is a specific question that seems to have come up in like you know the Declaration of Independence, uh, with this declaration that you know all men are created equal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this whole development of thought, and even in the in going over just the schools of thought previously, you have stuff like I don't know. Uh, the Hegelian schools, specifically that you know, Hegel got that whole thing with the universal consumed the particular. Yeah. And yeah. there's Thoreau the, and there's the, Wolf, yeah, and yeah. yeah, and there's Walt. I mean, it's also all uh, right. Yeah, and that's all individualistic uh you know development of the human spirit or the American spirit. And so we're we're coming to this question. It seems that the best way to go through this is America's philosophical issues, right? Where it's it's the two of them coming into relation and it's more. How does America help us develop an idea yeah. about philosophy? I don't know. I, I don't know if I would make such a strong claim as to say that it's the best, mm -hmm. right? It's like as I said, like I, you know, I could have taught the course a different way. Um, it's what I wanted to do. I mean, <laughs> it's my course. <laughs> That's what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, what? The will to power. Uh, no. Um, um, I mean, yeah, it seemed, seemed to me 
I guess, well, didn't it seem to me to be the best? Don't you always do what seems to you to be the best? <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe not. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, but other than that, that was a pretty good summary of what I can say, yes. Um, so, I mean, like, uh, this is the introductory lecture. So obviously when we get into actual texts, it's not gonna be all, I mean, all this stuff is gonna keep coming back. That's why I introduced it, but um, there's gonna be a lot more specific things to talk about. Um, but uh, that's the general background. There have been good questions. Are there any more questions? Okay, so if there are no more questions, I'm gonna, uh, like I said, since it's just the first lecture, I, I'm not gonna go the whole time. I don't have a text to talk about. Um, but uh, so remember again, what I said, the, the next class will be via Zoom on Monday. Um, and I hope to see you then. Bye.